Welcome to Mountain View. Thanks for joining us today. Whether you're new or this is your church home, you can find everything Mountain View on our hub at mtnvw.org slash hub. There you'll find info on giving, life groups, and kids. If you're new or have a prayer request, make sure to click the connect button. Stay in touch during the week by following us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Now before service starts, we want to give you an idea of what to expect. We will begin by singing a few songs together with the purpose of glorifying God through praise and worship. The lyrics will be displayed and we invite everyone to sing along. Following our songs, one of our teaching pastors will share a message about the good news in a relatable way, with the hope of growing our faith and understanding of God. Finally, we will take communion and sing again as a response to God's goodness. We also have programming for your kids and students throughout the week. You can find more information by going to mtnvw.org. Whether you're online or in person, we are so glad that you're here. Let's get ready to worship. Good morning, everyone. Whether you're online or in person, we're so thankful that you're worshiping with us today. Please stand as we begin to give God praise. The weapon may be for but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. Oh my God will never fail. Oh my God will never fail. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. Before the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. Before the battle belongs to you, Lord. Oh, oh, oh. This power in the I'm 
church amen amen some beautiful singing it's so good to see you all this morning whether online or in person let's continue to worship him amen through song as you know these words let's sing this together and celebrate him here we go two three up. got him on my knees let's shout it out to him prayer we lift up to him church all together we sing
That's worth celebrating. That's all right. Amen. You all sound so beautiful. If you haven't already, let's center our hearts and minds on him now. Give him this moment. Give him these words. As he's worthy. We sing spirit sound. Spirit sound, rushing wind, fire of God, fall within. Holy Ghost, breathe on us, we pray. As we repent, turn from sin, revival and restore the rain. Breath of God, fan us into we need a fresh wind, a fragrance of heaven, pour your spirit out, pour your spirit out. much for today. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to gather in this place, God, and worship you, worship you through music. God, I just pray a blessing over the offering, Lord. I just thank you for all the ways that you provide for us and that you bless us, and I pray that you will take this offering, Lord, that you will use it to expand your kingdom, God, that you will send it to the places where it's most needed. Thank you, Lord Jesus. As a result of your financial stewardship, we are able to teach children and students about Jesus. 
Through our regular weekend programming and special events throughout the year, we provide a safe, fun, and caring environment for faith to develop. Your tithes and offerings are an investment in the future, so thank you for your continued support. You can give by going to mtnvw.org slash give, texting the amount to the number on the screen, or by mail to 40 East Highlands Ranch Parkway. Thank you for your continual support of Mountain View Christian Church. Hey everybody, we just wanted to get an idea of what people think about God, so we're out in our city and we're gonna see what they say. What do you think that God is like? I don't think it's a gender conforming thing. Okay. Um, it's a powerful force. I believe it's a form of energy of the universe and the good things that we do, that is God. God is everything. He's total for me. I don't know, probably it's big. Yeah, and smart. Well, good morning, Mountain View family. How are we doing out here today and at home online? Everybody's good? Wonderful. We are glad to hear it. Before we get started today, I just wanted to draw your attention to something. For those of you who are in the room, you can see it all down here. I don't know if you can catch it online, um, but there is just like a ton of food. And you're probably thinking, was there a potluck later? I didn't know what was happening. Um, no, it is not a potluck. It is actually the result of an amazing week of camp we just finished here, kids camp last week. Um, all of this food that you see before you is stuff that our kids raised for the Backpack Society this week. It was awesome. It was a phenomenal week, and I just want to give it up for all of our kids who did such a great job for a wonderful organization that feeds school children right here in Highlands Ranch. Um, we are so excited to be able to give all of this wonderful, wonderful blessing to them. We are wrapping up our series. This is it, the last week of kicking the tires, um, as we've been asking some big questions about faith and about God. And today's question is really at the very core, the essence of what it means to be human, probably the question we have all asked ourselves at one point or another. And the question is this, does life have purpose? Does life have purpose? This is very, very, very important. At some level, all of us have had to consider and ponder what that looks like. We're not the only ones. There are movies and documentaries and books written about this topic all the time. People are in a constant pursuit of life's purpose. What does it mean? What is the meaning of all this stuff that we do? Books have been written like The Purpose Driven Life or The Secret or Man's Search for Happiness. We have been searching for happiness since the beginning of humankind. It's always been a thing. And today we are going to look at a book, one of many books from the Bible to see what God has to say about purpose, about life's purpose. And honestly, I think it's going to surprise some of you uh, what God has to say about what it means for our lives to have purpose. I want you to think about big existential questions you might have asked yourself in the past. What is the meaning of life? Does life have purpose? What is it all about? Maybe you've never asked yourself that question because you're super young and are going to live forever. Good for you. But for the rest of us who have been like, mm, I don't know, it might be getting close. What is it all about? What is the meaning of life? In order to answer that question from God's book, we're actually going to deconstruct purpose a little bit. Because my guess is, for most of us, when we think about life and life's purpose, we think about the things of this life that bring us fulfillment, that make us happy, life's pleasures. You're going to come to find that that is not what the Bible has to say about what purpose is and what meaning is all about. And in order to do that, we're going to go to the Old Testament, a fascinating book called Ecclesiastes. I don't know if anybody's ever read Ecclesiastes. What a humdinger. It's written by King David's son, Solomon. Solomon was known as the wisest man who ever lived. And he opens this book well, for those of you who've read the book, don't spoil it, okay? If you know what's about to happen, don't spoil it for your neighbors. If you haven't read the book, buckle up. Here we go. Um, it's very interesting how he begins Ecclesiastes. Wisest man who ever lived. This is what he has to say about life. Here it is, Ecclesiastes 1, verses 1 and following. The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless, 
everything is meaningless. What do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? Generations come, generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and then it hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and then turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, there they return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can even say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There's nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new. It was here already long ago. It was here before our time. No one remembers the former generation, and even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. Okay, isn't that special? So, why don't we break down and recap this very positive and uplifting verse for a Sunday morning? I know you are all really excited to hear that everything is meaningless, but we are going to break down this verse. I want to start with the Hebrew word that the NIV translates as meaningless, and that Hebrew word is hebel. Here's an interesting fact. The Bible was not written in English. <gasps> What? Wait, what are you talking about, Phil? Does this mean Jesus and King James didn't sit down to write the Bible? No. The Bible was not written in English. It was written in a different language, and it was written over thousands of years. As a result, language is complicated. Language is complicated. If I were to use a statement, a phrase with you, you would totally understand what I'm talking about because you are English speakers and you're living in the 21st century. But thousands of years from now, if someone were to deconstruct the sermon, they might be confused about what my intent was because they were not here at the time in which I said it. I don't have to explain to you turns of phrases. Like if I said, oh, that guy's 50, he's over the hill. Most of you understand what I mean. He's over the hill as in he's old. But thousands of years from now, they'll be like, so he walked over a hill? I don't actually, what's happening? Okay, that's how complicated language is. Things I don't have to explain to you because you get, we have to go back and look at context clues because we weren't here when this book was written. So, hebel. Hebel can mean many things. In this context, the NIV translates it as meaningless, which is pretty close. But if you were to look at the King James or other English translations of the Bible, they would use the word vanity. They would say vanity, which is probably closer than meaningless. Other words, English words that could be used to describe Hebel would be this, breath or vapor, like air. Okay, everything is vapor. Absurd, everything is absurd or ineffective. Ineffective, absurd, breath, vanity, meaningless. These are all words that we could use, our best English equivalent to describe Hebel. So today, I'm just going to use the word Hebel because, well, it's in the original text, and it's probably the closest word we have. Everything is Hebel. And this is what Solomon has to say. Everything that you do is in vain. Everything. Everything you do is temporary, like breath. <sighs> Everything you do will not accomplish what you hope it will accomplish, which is fulfillment and purpose. Everything you do. The pleasures of this world are not necessarily hebel, but they will fail to satisfy you in the long run, which means they are a waste of time if the ultimate goal is finding purpose and fulfillment in them. That's what the wisest man who ever lived has to say. He goes on to say, even the planet on which we live is this, this vicious, never-ending circle. The sun does what the sun does, period, the end. Rises and falls, rises and falls, rises and falls. No end in sight. Rivers run to the sea, but they can't fill it. On top of that, here's a real happy nugget for you on a Sunday. After a life of hard work, you die. Yay! <laughs> That's it. The end. You can't take anything that you've gained with you, not an ounce of it. It's like breath. And then you're done. No one has ever changed the natural course of time. So when you die, you leave no trace of having ever been here. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. From dust you were born to dust you shall return. Generations come and generations go. And then the newer generations come and they replace the old generations. Out with the old, in with the new. Speaking of new, nothing is new, according to Solomon, nothing. 
Not a single thing is new, and nothing has eternal fame. It doesn't matter how popular or known or regarded or educated you are. The foundational moments of life, birth, work, death, they come for everyone. And no one is going to remember that you were here. Yet we continue this endless quest for money and power and respect and fame, even though we're all moving toward death. Now, we hear passages like this, <laughs> and we think, who selected this for a Sunday? I need to be uplifted. I hear you. I'm not going to leave you down here. But I want you to get an idea of what the wisest man who ever lived had to say about life. It's hebel. It's meaningless. Meaningless. Now, these passages probably give us all of the feels, okay? Because Solomon has stripped away all of the things that traditionally give our existence meaning and purpose, which give our existence fulfillment and life. When we are faced with the reality that everything that gives our lives purpose is hebel, sometimes, oftentimes, it leaves us feeling empty and lonely and abandoned. Or maybe it just leaves you speechless, which is how I felt the first time I read this passage ever. I was in high school, and I was like, what is Solomon's problem? Like, was it a bad day? Calm down. Um, but it's a lot. Everything is meaningless. Now, if you're the eternal optimist, you're thinking, ugh, here comes the pessimist manifesto over here. Like, I get it, because you're like, no, life isn't that bad. Hey, eat some ice cream. Like, it's probably going to be okay. But even the eternal optimist has to admit at some point, Solomon has a point, everything just returns to death in the end. That's true. That's true. At some point, he's telling the truth. At the very least, this verse might make you want to make the most of every moment, which is why phrases like YOLO become a really big deal, because you only live once. And if what Solomon says is true and everything is meaningless, then you got to do everything you can right now. There's an urgency to do everything you can right now to make this life meaningful. Or maybe you think to yourself, why even bother? Why even bother with life? What's the point? And honestly, that's a fair question. That is a fair question, because if this is where the story ends, then that's exactly where we should all be. What is the point? If everything is vapor and meaningless, what is the point of anything we do, anything we say? Maybe that's where you are right now. Maybe you have dealt with this existential crisis and have come to the same place that Solomon has. Who cares? Doesn't matter. Well, no matter where you are on this journey of understanding, I want to give you a little bit of hope because I think Solomon is right. Everything is meaningless, but I don't think he was a pessimist or in a depressive state. In fact, I think Solomon was crying out for something greater than what this life has to offer. You see, the world is a slave to destruction, and there is nothing that you and I can do, nothing that humankind can do to explain it, to alter it, or to find satisfaction in it. Everything is meaningless. And then Jesus Christ came. Did you hear that? Everything is meaningless. And then Christ came. I want to skip over to the New Testament book of Acts for a moment. We're going to head to chapter 17 here in a minute. I actually preached on this passage we're about to be in in the book of Acts a couple of weeks ago when we were in the midst of this Kicking the Tires series, and I intentionally left out a couple of verses a couple of weeks ago when I was preaching in this passage because I knew I was going to be using it today. It's kind of a part two of the part one that happened. So instead of me rehashing everything I totally explained in the last sermon, I'm just going to show you what I said in the last sermon. So everybody take a look. Paul was in Athens, the very same Athens you could visit today, and he notices that the people who live there are very devout. They are in a constant pursuit of God. Everywhere he goes, there are, there are statues and there are sacrifices and rituals and monuments to these gods. They're everywhere. And he says when he addresses the people, I can, I've been in your fair city. I see that you're very devout. That's great, wonderful. But there's one statue in particular that he really hones in on. And there's this statue in the center of town that simply says, to an unknown God. Because just want to make sure all your bases are covered. In case we forgot one of them, also the unknown ones we also forgot. Then here's your statue. Okay, great. Therefore, since we are all God's offspring, all of us, 
All of us have been created by the creator. We are all God's offspring. We should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed, referring to Jesus Christ. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead, again, referring to Jesus Christ. Paul basically says here in this moment, look, everything that you are looking for, Athens, it's been revealed. Everything that you're looking for, no need to keep all of your options open. God has given us the answer to our questions and the freedom we seek in the person of Jesus Christ. Wow, that middle-aged guy's really onto something. Uh, <laughs> yes, indeed, that person has been revealed in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, came into the world, not to condemn the world, as if the world needs any more condemning, it's doing a perfectly good job on its own, but to save the world. You see, everything is meaningless, everything. But then Christ came. And when he came, he came and he did something new. He did a new thing. He opened up a way of understanding and escape from the meaningless hebel of this world. He put together a new agreement between the creator of all things, God, and his greatest creation, you and I. Through Christ, all things are made new. There is a new birth, which we call salvation. There is a new life that's full of everything that you're looking for, purpose and hope. And in this new creation, we are given a new name. It's a new name that will last forever. And that name is sanctified, justified, loved, eternal. That is the backdrop of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to talk for a minute about a life lived with purpose, which is where Paul is getting at with the people of Athens in this moment. Here are the two verses that come right before Paul reveals to the people of Athens the, per the person of Jesus Christ. These are the verses that come right before that. Here it is. From one man he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out to him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Paul emphasizes in this moment humankind's relationship to God. Because even though there's a lot of us all over, billions of us all over, spread out over the planet, we share a common ancestry and a relationship to the one true God. And Paul wanted the people of Athens to know that God cares about his greatest creation. And he's talking about us. And since you and I are the creation created in his image, indeed, God has given us a purpose. Do you want to know what it is? Here's the purpose. Ready? Drum roll, please. Our purpose in life is to seek God first. Our purpose in life is to seek God first. God's greatest desire for his greatest creation is that we would seek him and just possibly as we're stumbling through the dark, reach for him. And when we reach for him, he promises that you will find him. That's amazing. You're looking for purpose in life? You could try all the things of this world. You can be successful. You could be famous. You could be rich. You could be wealthy in family. You love your family. You love your kids, your grandkids, and that's all great, and it's all hebel. Even if it's for great lofty goals, the only thing in this life that will ever give you purpose is Christ Jesus. Seeking God first. First. But don't take my word for it. Let's hear from Jesus Christ himself, the son of the living God. In Matthew's gospel, chapter 6, verses 19 through 20, Jesus says this, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. 
Jesus is saying here in this moment that to store up things of this earth, that's hebel, that's temporary. Instead, turn it and find spiritual things to store, things that are going to last well beyond this life, things like holiness of character, things like obedience, things like souls won to Christ, things like unconditional love. Because here's the point that Jesus makes, even if you could, even if you could store up earthly riches, you still have no control over when you die, which Ecclesiastes made abundantly clear. You have no control over when you die. But if we put our trust in God first, then God will take care of the rest of life. Then Jesus goes on to say this about seeking God in verse 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be given to you as well. Do you hear that? Seek first his kingdom, and all of these things are given to you. So what does that look like? What does that practically look like as we try to live out maybe a new definition of purpose? We had to deconstruct earthly purpose so that we could fill it with godly purpose, and God makes it clear that I want you to seek me. And when you seek me, you will find me. God is not hiding from you. God is right in your midst even now. And all he says is seek and you'll find what you're looking for. You'll find the purpose and the fulfillment that you're looking for. So how do we practically put this purpose into play? The first thing is this. We have to say yes to Jesus. We have to say yes to Jesus. If you have never said yes to Jesus in any context, and I am talking specifically to you, to people who need to know that Jesus Christ is the thing that you're looking for. Our entire world spends countless, countless trillions of dollars and all of this time and energy searching for purpose when the answer is right in front of them. Everything that they're seeking for, they don't have to seek anymore, which is why Paul said to Athens, you don't need a statue to an unknown God. God has made himself known. He's made himself known in the person of Jesus Christ. No more seeking. You don't have to. Here he is. Seek him, and you'll find everything that you're looking for. More fulfillment, more purpose, more hope than you could ever hold in one lifetime. Seek it and you'll find it. If that is a purpose that you're looking for, and you're in this room, we have pastors who want to meet with you out here and talk to you about what it means to say yes to Jesus. If you're watching online, we want you to text yes to Jesus to the number that's coming up on the screen. Say yes to Jesus. For those of us who have said yes to Jesus in one way, shape, or form, maybe it's time to keep saying yes. It's not a one and done thing. Because the reality is we live in this broken world with all of its hebel, with all of its meaninglessness, and it's really easy for us to get wrapped up and to tie our identity to temporary things of this world. What would I do if I lost my job tomorrow? I don't know who I am, the world says. When we tie and tether ourselves to something that is eternal like Christ Jesus, that changes the dynamic. It gives your life a purpose far greater than the thing that you do on this earth, which is here today and then gone tomorrow. We have got to anchor our purpose to Christ Jesus. So sometimes that requires us to say yes to Jesus every day when we wake up. Every day we say yes to Jesus. Jesus completes me. He fulfills me. He gives me purpose. Jesus, Christ, and Christ alone. So saying yes to Jesus for the first time or saying it every day, we all have to say yes to Jesus. The second is this, turn to Jesus for help. I think it's amazing that the creator of the universe, the creator of the universe wants to have a relationship with you and wants to communicate to you. You can talk to God whenever you want through prayer. Just right now. It doesn't have to be fancy on your knees with your hands like this. It doesn't have to be that way. You could talk to God right now, and he wants to hear from you. The reality is that this life is hard. It's hard. On top of everything being hebel, then you have all the bad things and the injustices and the sadness that comes with living this weary, exhausting life, and that's hard, and you're going to need help. God knows that, which is why he gave you direct communication to him through prayer. So talk to him, say yes to him, and then turn to him for help. Even if life is hard and sometimes feels impossible, that's what God is there for. God does the stuff only a God can do. 
but you have to talk to him and turn to him for help. And the third is this, follow him. Follow him. Say yes to him, ask him for help, follow him. Serve and obey him in all things. Worship him with all that you are and all that you do. Submit to his rule over your life. Part of doing that is trusting the process. Even if you're not in control and you don't understand or are not sure of what the outcome is going to be, that's part of serving him and obeying him in all things. And let me tell you what happens when we do this. When we do these things and put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ, and he becomes our reason, our purpose, then all of the other pleasures of life, whatever that is for you, all of those wonderful pleasures of life are not meaningless, but they are added blessings to an otherwise miserable human reality, truth be told. The birth of your first child, watching that child grow up and become a parent of their own and never sleeping again, becoming a grandparent, if you're lucky enough, a great-grandparent, retiring, going on vacations, watching the sunset, eating at your favorite restaurants. All of these things will never give your life purpose, but they can be added blessings when your purpose in life is to seek God. They are added blessings of life. Seek him first, and then all those other things will be given to you. Isn't that wonderful? Seek him first. Truly is your life's purpose. Because when all of that is stripped away, when you come to the end of this life and it is all stripped away, you will always have Jesus. Always. Always. Here's the thing. We all have a bright and glorious future to look forward to. Not because you're successful or smart or educated or have a great family, but because of Christ Jesus. You have a bright future ahead of you. Let's make this life not meaningless, but meaningful. Not for the wrong reasons, but for the right reason. And the only reason in this whole world that I can come up with that makes life worth living is Christ Jesus. Seek him and you will find him. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you want to be found by us, your greatest creation. You sent your son to this world so that you could be found by us. God, you promise in your word that if we seek you, we will not have to seek far because you are here with us and we will find you. This hope and this purpose that we've been looking for, let us anchor ourselves to your word and to your truth. It's in your son's precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Waking up knowing there's a reason All my dreams come alive Life is for living with you I made my decision You lift me up, fill my eyes with wonder Forever young in your love This freedom's untainted with you No moment is wasted sun now bursting through the clouds black and white turn to color all around all is new in the savior i am found this is living now this is living now You take me higher than I've been before. It's your perfect love that saves me so. God, your freedom is an open door. You are everything I want and
In your love I'm complete There's nothing like living with you This life you created I choose See the sun now bursting through the clouds Black and white turn to color all around All is new in the Savior I'm found This is living now Your freedom is an open door. You are everything I want and more. Ooh. Ooh. See the sun now bursting through the clouds, black and white. Turn to color all around, all is new in the Savior I am found. See the sun now bursting through the clouds, black and white. Turn to color all around, all is new in the Savior I am found. This is living now. Your freedom is an open door. You are everything I want and more. Amen. Amen. If you have your communion elements at home, you can prepare those now. For those of you in the room, you can grab your elements as well. We talk a lot about God here in this place. We talk a lot about Jesus here in this place. And for those of you who watch us online or come in person, you've probably heard us talk about God and Jesus, God and Jesus quite a bit. But something happens when Monday rolls around and the reality of life starts to sink in. It's really easy to forget. I'll admit it. It's hard sometimes to remember, oh, this thing about God or to remember that I'm supposed to do this or to remember to try doing something differently. It's not easy because life happens. One of the best ways that I know to constantly be in a state of remembrance is to do what we're about to do right now, which is take Holy Communion together, to remember what Christ Jesus did for us on the cross. Because here's the thing. It wasn't enough that God sent his son, but God had to send his son into this hebel to die so that the meaninglessness would have purpose because of who he is and what he's done. It is so significant that even at the time when he was trying to explain it to his disciples, they didn't understand. They were sitting at a meal, and he took some bread, and he said, this is my body broken for you, and I want you to do this and remember me. This is some juice. I want you to drink this and remember me. And they didn't fully understand everything that he was about to do for them until after the fact. But the fact remains, what Christ Jesus did for them and for us has changed the course of history forever. It has given our life meaning and value and purpose. And sometimes in the weightiness of this hebel that we live in, it's easy to forget. So we come here to this moment to remember. Not just to remember that Christ Jesus came, not just to remember that he came and died, but to remember that he came and died and was brought back to life. And because he's alive, our lives have purpose. They have value. They have significance. They're important to God, which is why he sent his son to begin. So today, as you take your communion at home or here in person, I want you to remember that we need to remember so that we don't forget where our hope and our purpose and our joy really comes from. Let's pray.
Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the sacrifice of your son Jesus on the cross, the same sacrifice that gives our lives meaning. Thank you. Thank you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. In response to his goodness, let's stand and sing one more song together as a church. sin anymore and should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning either way I will bow to the things of this world And the power lives in me There is another in the fire
four years, almost four years, just about. Uh, there's so many to thank. And like the last service, I'm just going to thank Jesus. I'm going to thank Jesus for the rest of my life, for everything he's done and everything he's doing. And that's what worship is. It's a response to everything God has done in our lives and is currently doing in our lives. Amen. And that's why we come together as a community of believers, seekers, searchers, that we can just glorify him wherever we are in our journey. And my prayer is that every single one of us continue to take that next step, even in horrible, difficult seasons or really awesome seasons. We continue to seek him out, amen? And God has made a way in my life, and I'm so very grateful to him, and I'm grateful to this church for giving me that opportunity to just share God's love with all of you all and to grow in him. And thank you to the staff. Thank you to Ken and his leadership and his, being a head pastor and just everything that he does behind the scenes that nobody sees is incredibly humbling. There's no way we could ever fathom what it takes. And to Tracy, our executive pastor, who will never come up on this stage <laughs> as much as I ask her to, I'm just so grateful for her. She is the mother of this staff. <laughs> she takes care of all of us. If you know her, just give her a hug at some point just to thank her for everything she does that you don't see. That's the true humility and sacrifice is doing something for others that they may not ever see, that we get a chance to do something behind the scenes. I especially take, uh, I especially love that about their hearts. Um, being someone who is on the stage and trying to fight for moments where I can be behind the scenes and make a real sacrifice. Uh, Phil, Phil's, Phil did a great job, amen? Preach, <laughs> preach, preach. Y'all may not know this, but we just had kids campus last week and he and I were up here singing together every day. Amen, amen, amen. It was wonderful. But I think Ken has some things to say, so I'm going to get off this mic before I keep talking too much. As I mentioned at the 9 o'clock service, I have been on staff serving in Mountain View for 12 years, and I have seen lots of things happen on this stage as a result of God's working in people's lives who make themselves available God has done incredible things. I remember back in, Jay, was it January or February of 2018? In February of 2018, Jay had joined staff at the end of 2017. And back in those days, we would end our services like this with whoever preached coming out and saying a final word, a blessing, and a benediction. And then I had done so, and I was walking off, and Jay said, I've got one more thing. And he introduced us to Kelly, who was then his girlfriend. And he got down on one knee about where he's standing right now on a Saturday night. And he asked Kelly to, to be his wife. And if you're new to Mountain View, she did say yes. So she, uh, she agreed. And they got married uh, later that year. 
So this stage has, has seen many things over, uh, over its life going back to 2002. And so we're very privileged to have had Jay a part of our team for these last several years. I believe very strongly in the words of the Hebrew writer that we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And because of that, he tells us to be thankful. To be thankful. To worship God acceptably with reverence and with awe. Life has changes. And changes happen even in church. And above and behind it all is the steady presence of God. I'm thankful to be a part of a stream of people that go back 2,000 years to the first followers of Christ. And we join that stream, we take our part in that story, and we're privileged to do so. And Jay, we're thankful to have had you and Kelly. You got to see this last service, but I took it back. So today, this service, he gets to hold it. That thing's heavy. So and here's a card as well. And as we do, whenever we send off staff or missionaries or folks to plant churches or whatever it might be, we always close with prayer. And we do so as a family, recognizing that perhaps we may not see each other from week to week, and maybe it's only those reunions or special holidays, but we're still part of the same family. So we're going to close praying for Jay and for Kelly. I'm going to ask anyone who wants to to join us up here on stage or if you want to come up close to the stage. This is our final piece of worship this morning. If you'd like to stay where you are, just kind of place your hand out. We're going to close with prayer. We pray God's blessing on Jay and on his family. As, as you may have seen in our email announcement this past week, uh, Ian Black, who did come lead worship for us back in June, has accepted our, our offer, our call to be our next worship pastor, and he'll be joining us in September. And in between, we will continue to worship God serve a great God. We pray that God will bless Jay and Kelly, not just as a husband and wife and a family, uh, but their ministry in Oregon, uh, where they are moving up to Roseville, and that God's light will shine bright as a result. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much, because God, we recognize that you are our Father Almighty, the Lord everlasting, the creator of heaven and earth. And Father, there are things that come and go. There are seasons. But you are in the midst of them all. That you are a steady presence, a rock of ages. And Father, we are thankful for this season of life that you've blessed us with at Mountain View. For God, the opportunity to not just serve alongside Jay and Kelly, but to know them as friends and to know them as family. And so, Father, we pray your blessings upon them as they transition to a new place to live, to a new community, to a new church, that, Father, you prepare the way, uh, that, Father, you go before them. Father, we pray that Jay's ministry will flourish in Oregon and that your kingdom there in Oregon in the Northwest will be blessed. Father, we thank you for this church. We thank you, God, for your church. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Thank you all so much. So grateful. Again, I can't stress the amount of joy that comes from this staff, from Caleb, from uh, all the spouses that have supported us. Sorry, I got to make sure everybody gets heard. I know somebody's going to be like, Jay, you didn't say my name. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But most of all, I want to thank all of you for being a part of this community, as Pastor Ken mentioned, and just how excited I am to see what Ian has in store for the worship culture and how he's going to make it his own, just as I was allowed very humbly to make it my own, uh, and as Daniel passed the torch on to myself. So God bless you all one last time. Let him continue to bless you, and uh, I won't see you next week, but we'll be back to visit. God bless. Have a great week.